Welcome to the VM Sources video, iSCSI Storage and VMware vSphere 5, Implementing Multiple Storage Paths and Using Jumbo Frames. I'm John Borhek, Chief Solutions Architect for VM Sources Group, Incorporated. We're a full service virtualization provider with offices in Philadelphia, Phoenix, and Los Angeles. What we're going to do today is configure iSCSI Storage with multiple storage paths and jumbo frames using two different methods. Method 1, a single vSwitch configuration, and method 2, a multiple vSwitch configuration. In method 1, we're going to connect to ESXi5, we're going to create our VM kernels, we're going to set our NIC failover order, we're going to add an iSCSI host bus adapter, we're going to implement port binding, we're going to add dynamic discovery IP addresses, and then we're going to manage our multiple paths. Using method 2, with multiple vSwitches, we're going to connect to ESXi5, we're going to create our VM kernels, we're going to add our iSCSI HPAs, we're going to implement port binding, we're going to add dynamic discovery IP addresses, and then we're going to manage our multiple storage paths. Before we get started, if you'd like to download a guide to go with our video, go to our website, www.vmsources.com, choose the Resources tab, select VM Sources White Papers, and then download iSCSI Storage and VMware vSphere 5. Let's go ahead and get started by opening up the VMware vSphere client and connecting either to an ESX server or to a vCenter server. In this case, we're going to connect directly to an ESX server using its host name. If you haven't configured host name resolution in your environment, simply specify the IP address of your ESX server. We're going to type the username root and our default password. We'll install the certificate and choose ignore. And here we are at a freshly installed instance of ESX server. The first thing we're going to want to do is choose the Configuration tab and then choose the Networking option. We're going to select properties of our standard vSwitch 0 and we're going to begin by going to Network Adapters and adding a network adapter. You simply can't have multiple storage paths with only one network adapter associated with a single vSwitch. Okay, now we see vSwitch 0 with both VMNIC 0 and VMNIC 1, both showing a gigabit full duplex connection. Let's go back into Properties of vSwitch 0, and let's select Edit the vSwitch itself. One of the first things we want to do is set the MTU of the vSwitch itself for 9000. 9000 is the commonly accepted standard for jumbo frames. If we fail to set the MTU here on the vSwitch, none of the following configurations will work properly. The next thing we're going to want to do, again selecting properties of vSwitch 0, is to choose Add and create two VM kernel connections. I like to leave the default network label for a VM kernel connection alone and simply append something about its functionality. For example, iSCSI01. Our storage network happens to be on VLAN ID 25, and because this is an exclusively iSCSI storage VM kernel, we are not going to choose vMotion, fault tolerance, or management traffic for this particular VM kernel. We're going to assign it an IP address on our storage network, and the subnet mask and we're not going to change the VM kernel default gateway. If we actually set the VM kernel default gateway to the gateway address that's on our storage network, we might risk accidentally making iSCSI storage routable. Excellent. There's our first VM kernel connection. Let's go ahead and add a second VM kernel connection. 
just the same as the last, except for with a slightly different name, iSCSI 02, VLAN 25, In our environment, we increment VM kernel IP addresses by 20. That allows us to have 20 different ESX servers with unique VM kernels. And we'll go ahead and hit close. And there are our two newly created VM kernels. We're not done yet. We need to go back to properties and we need to choose VM kernel iSCSI 01, the lowest numbered of our two VM kernel connections, and select edit. There are a number of properties that we couldn't edit before, such as the MTU of the VM kernel itself. We're going to set this for 9000, just like we set on the vSwitch. Now very importantly, we need to come to NIC teaming and select Override Switch Failover Order. If we're going to implement multiple storage paths on a single vSwitch, we need to set only one NIC as active for each VM kernel connection. In this case, because I'm using the lowest numbered VM kernel connection, I am going to leave the lowest numbered NIC as active and place any other NICs into the position of unused adapters. I'm going to click Move Down, Move Down, and now VM NIC 1 is unused and VMNIC0 remains as an active adapter. Now I'm going to select VM kernel iSCSI02, edit, jumbo frames, override switch failover order, and because this is the higher numbered of our two VM kernel connections, I'm going to leave the higher numbered VMNIC as active while moving the lower numbered VMNIC down to unused. That does it for our network configuration. The next thing we need to do is select storage adapters. One of the more significant differences between vSphere 4 and vSphere 5 is that the software iSCSI adapter isn't even included by default in VMware vSphere 5. We need to choose add and add a software iSCSI adapter. And there it is, VMHBA32, our software iSCSI adapter. We'll go ahead and click on Properties. To begin with, you'll notice that the software iSCSI initiator is already enabled. Let's choose the tab Network Configuration and choose to add a VM kernel port binding. We have only two port groups available to us. Each one of them is associated with a different VM NIC. Let's simply choose to add both of them. And now we have two VM kernel port bindings, each one associated with a different VM NIC. The next step is to go to the Dynamic Discovery tab and enter the IP address or IP addresses of each of your SANs. If your iSCSI SANs themselves have more than one IP address, only enter one IP address per controller. This is the SAN targets or discovery aspect of the iSCSI initiator. All of the associated IP addresses with any iSCSI SAN or iSCSI SAN controller will actually be discovered just by entering the first IP address. Our EMC iSCSI SAN is at 192.168.200.20, and although it has multiple NICs associated with it, both NICs are bound to this one IP address. Now that the IP address of our SAN has appeared in SAN targets, we can click on Static Discovery, and we can see all of the IP addresses and or all of the target names of each of our LUNs or iSCSI targets associated with this iSCSI initiator. And it's going to ask us to rescan our host bus adapter. We'll choose yes. And in a relatively few seconds, you saw just exactly how long that took. It took 
three seconds, much faster in ESX5 than in ESX4, it's seen all three LUNs that we have configured on this SAN. We have three 800 gigabyte LUNs. You'll notice there are three devices, but there are six paths. When we select the paths view, we see that each iSCSI target has two paths, one active for I.O. and one simply active. There are six paths in total for three devices. With EMC, every target is associated with a single LUN. Let's now go to storage. We've named each of the VMFS volumes that we connected to Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 for use with storage DRS. Let's select one of our VMFS volumes and choose Properties and then go to Manage Paths. You can see that the path selection policy is set as fixed. That means while both paths are active, only one path is used for I.O. Let's select the path selection policy round robin. If this is supported by your storage vendor, it could conceivably be a much more efficient storage policy. Choose Change, and you can see almost immediately that both paths are not only active, but they're also in use for I.O. We'll go ahead and close, and we'll do the same thing for each of our other lines. Please continue watching Method 2 of VMware vSphere and iSCSI storage as we configure a multiple vSwitch configuration.